This is the Jabberjaw Podcast Network. Support for 100 Words or Less comes from Talenti. When Talenti makes gelato and sorbetto, they tend to get a little overzealous. Did they need to use so many raspberries in their Roman raspberry sorbetto that the machine broke? Did they need to try 25 different chai teas to find the perfect spice blend from their vanilla chai gelato? Did they have to invent giant mint steepers to make their Mediterranean mint super minty? Did their obsessiveness make Talenti, Gelato, and Sorbetto the greatest? You be the judge. But yes, it does make them the greatest, and they're also the judge. Talenti, the deliciousness in the details. Trust me, this stuff is amazing. Try it out. Oh boy, I'm here to tell you about my favorite company, Mack Weldon. Now, what do they do? They make amazing underwear, pants, sweaters, sweatshirts, you name it. They will put it on your body and you will be amazed at how comfortable this stuff is. I can use it for the gym. I can use it for hanging around the house. I can even use it on a date with my wife and she'll be like, you know what? You look nice. And I'm like, yeah, I do because I'm wearing Mack Weldon. So please go to MacWeldon.com and use the code WORDS, I will get you 20% off. Please use that code because that way they know that we sent you. Trust me, this stuff is absolutely incredible. I'm wearing their shorts and underwear right now. So go to MacWeldon.com, enter the promo code WORDS, and you'll thank me for it later. Now, here's the awesome show. Yes, we're doing this. Welcome to another episode of 100 Words or Less, the podcast. I'm your host, Ray Harkins. And we are discussing independent music and how awesome it is, how cool the people are that are involved with it. Well, not maybe not cool, but how influential this whole stuff is. I just, each day that passes, there's some random connection to music that I'm able to make either through my day job or, you know, listening to interviews with other people. I'm just so thankful for this awesome community. And yeah, and thank you as the community of listeners around this show because uh, this show just keeps getting so much better because of your support and your listenership and your communication. I really appreciate it. So thank you from the bottom of my heart because we just celebrated five years. That's awesome, right? And I'm going to keep plugging away, getting some awesome guests and some fun stuff going into your ear holes. And this week is definitely no exception to the rule. This one, I'm going to admit, I was so damn nervous in having this person on my show because uh, their presence looms large in independent music, and that is none other than Buzz Osborne from the Melvins. The Melvins. Let that sink in. So if you haven't heard the Melvins, totally understandable. You haven't been paying attention to music, (laughs) but in all honesty, the Melvins are probably one of the most influential bands within rockish music, heavy music, metal, whatever you want to call it. They're not calling it anything. They've been existing outside the normal parameters of music for quite some time. And Buzz Osborne is, uh, you know, people would say a character. Some people might say prickly. Frankly, like I said, I was really nervous about this because, you know, this dude has done 475,000 interviews. Like I'm not even exaggerating when I'm saying he probably has spent many waking hours doing interviews around his records because you know the band is incredibly prolific uh they're out there they've existed for you know 20 plus years they've done the damn thing so for my schlubby podcast to talk to him i felt weird about that and i always feel weird about that it's like i i don't i want to make sure that i'm coming at them with intelligent questions that they actually enjoy engaging with it so like i said a lot of trepidation and nervousness approaching this one i'll tell you more about it in a minute but i I gotta indulge some of the things that i like to tell you about on occasions and this one i am telling you about the new rise against record it just came out but you can go to riseagainstshop.com and you can dive into all of the cool packages they have around the record a lot of the stuff is sold out now and the record is officially out so you will get it shipped to you immediately wolves is the record riseagainstshop.com they're they're such a great band i can't wait to see them in like i don't know three weeks or so when they come through with thrice and deftones it's what a, what a bill right that is such a killer bill so i can't wait to see that show but yes riseagainstshop.com just just dive into it the record's amazing trust me you'll buy it and you'll listen to it on vinyl and you'll be like yes ray you were right i appreciate that and um yeah i think that's all that i got in in the form of the the plugs but uh like I said, Buzz, he was uh, he could not have been more pleasant. And, you know, it's one of those things where I realize that if you are earnest and sincere, not only about the questions, but the way that you approach people, they'll pick up on it pretty quickly and realize that you're not just, uh, you know, 
some, you know, fly by night person who uh, isn't interested or is like, you know, trying to, you know, be a a 15 year old music journalist and writing for their Tumblr page or whatever. And no slight against those people because I was one of them, except I wasn't writing on Tumblr. I was, you know, writing in my own zines. But nonetheless, Buzz was awesome. He, uh, we got, we, we talked about golf for like 15 minutes and I loved every moment of it. But we also talk about influence and a bunch of other great things that, uh, yeah, and Buzz was able to basically be himself and, you know, go off about certain things. And I was just like, well, that's a that's a wild opinion. I'll let that sit there. Uh, moving right along. <laughs> but it was great because, uh, yeah, he's just his honest, his honest self living his life and making amazing music. So, yeah, thank you, Buzz, for caring enough to do this show. And, uh, yeah, I'll let that sit. And here is the interview with Mr. Osborne from the Melvins. I can't even really understand that, but here's the show. Thirty-six years old, I got exposed to you um, once I started working at an independent record store here in Southern California. Um, basically, you know, through bands like Neurosis and uh, Isis, uh, just you know, referencing the Melvins constantly in regards to uh, you know the the tree of influence, as it were. Um, and it was, uh, you know, I mean, it was one of those things. I was alive when the grunge explosion happened, but uh, for whatever reason, you guys didn't pop up on my radar. Um, is it interesting for you to kind of see how sort of, you know, far and wide your influence has reached in regards to people like maybe bands that cite you guys as influences? And you're like, I don't even see how they could be influenced by us because they either sonically don't sound like us or they, uh, you know, don't, you just can't see the direct correlation between the influence. Is that weird for you to see? Um, uh, yeah, you know, in some, some cases it's, it's odd to see someone who, uh, is, is, is clearly referencing you as a massive influence and you think everything they do is totally horrendous. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, that's a little irritating, but you think, well, you know, better us than someone else. But, um, when listening to your music, I would say, don't blame me, you know, for right. where you're at. <laughs> <laughs> Usually, you know, um, but you know, I'm fine with that. I mean, uh, um, uh, uh it doesn't. It doesn't bother me to be an influence on other bands. I mean, certainly better us than a lot of other bands, like I said. But, uh, but yeah, you know, it's yeah. cool. I don't spend a lot of time thinking about it. No. Right. No. Yeah. I, I was about to say or joke that you know I, I don't imagine you sitting at your house just pontificating on the fact that uh, oh my gosh, this is my my range of influence is so so great. I just can't wait to think about it for five hours today. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, you have people that go on and on about those sorts of things, about how amazing it is, and you know, other, uh, the vast majority of the world who literally doesn't give a shit. So, <laughs> <laughs> totally, totally, it's like, yeah, we, we, we'd like to believe that our awesome independent music scene is uh, so far reaching, and yes, it is. But there are times where it's just like, oh yeah, but like a wide swath of the country has no clue that any of this is happening. Yes, that's the way it's always been, and it's not surprising to me. Right. Totally. You know, I'm not. I'm not like what. You know? Are you kidding? I mean, it's just. It's never. It's never not been that way. I mean, right. we've never had massive success. So, you know, on a on a you know, on a uh, 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 traditional in a traditional sense of the word, but our influence is certainly global. Right. Without without us, the world is a different place musically. Which you know, I mean, for for what it's worth i mean there it is i don't particularly um care too much about that i mean i think it's cool i wasn't wrong you know that's nice to know that but beyond that it's like what have you done lately <laughs> <laughs> that's very true i i also think that uh, a lot of people you know cite you guys as influences um just on the sheer maybe not uh, just on the attitude and the aesthetics of the band that like you know clearly you guys uh have carved out a niche where you know you can frankly do what you want with a large level of experimentation and people will probably follow along with it um, so I imagine a lot of people are like, oh, yeah, Melvin's are a huge influence, but, you know, we play pop music or whatever, you know, it's like the, they they aspire to the ideals of the Melvins. 
Oh, uh, probably not when it comes down to it. Um, they uh, probably don't aspire to any of our ideals whatsoever, or they wouldn't be doing most of the stuff they're doing. <laughs> True. They, can say, they can say that sort of thing, but, you know, no one's got a gun to their head making them play, you know, a, a Kmart-style punk rock pop, you know? But, you know. Yeah. No, it's a very- doing it for the money or whatever. Maybe they're, maybe they're making money. I mean, I don't know if there was ever a golden era when bands always made money, you know? I mean, uh uh, just like now they go, well, now that you can't make any money selling records, well, it's like, well, bands never got paid for selling records. <laughs> totally. When was this time when labels were totally cool and just handed out, you know, wrote massive checks to bands for selling records? I, I, I'm not aware of that. You know, if you take people like Bo Diddley, he claimed his entire life he never got paid for anything. So, right. you know, it's certainly during the heyday of when uh, supposedly people were selling records. So I don't know. I don't know. You know, it's weird. It's, it's very strange. Right. <laughs> totally. Totally. What's um, the joke? Uh, the joke you could line up everyone who's ever uh, who's 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 uh, uh, been influenced by Bo Diddley. You could line them all up in a big long line, and 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 even if he did that, he still wouldn't get any royalties. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's just like he'd be going up and down the line. Hey, do you got a dollar? You got no, nothing, 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 nothing. No. That's just how that's how it goes. I mean, you know. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, we uh, have done lots of records where labels didn't pay us a nickel. Mm-hmm. Not lots, but you know, more than one. <laughs> sure. Well, yeah. It's like you get your you know your meager advance to record, and then you're like no advance, zero advance, right? <laughs> no advance. Are you kidding? What sort of world of make-believe are you living in? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I worked at record labels. Like, I worked at uh, Century Media Records for, you know, a while doing a lot of, I mean, definitely not the same stuff as what you were doing. But, you know, I mean, enough to be like, hey, here's like three grand to record your record or whatever. Um, yeah, and then good luck with that, and we will never pay you another penny. R- oh, exact. That, and that there <laughs> lies the, uh, the rub, where it's like bands, <laughs> bands would be like, oh, cool, I got like 10 grand to record. And then it's like... Oh, but we spent that. It's like, okay, cool. Well, you're not going to see any more money until your quote unquote records have sold. <laughs> and then even then it's going to be questionable. True. I mean, you know, it's just, it, it's just what, you know, what's the longest distance between two, two points, the distance between a band and a check from a independent record label. <laughs> <laughs> That's very true. Um, well, well, we'll hit on some of those, uh, those notions a little bit later, but you know, kind of backing up and focusing it on you where, you know, obviously born in the Pacific Northwest and, you know, clearly you've spoken about that, uh, you know, at length, but you know, I, I didn't really get a sense of like what your family structure was like, you know, mom and dad in the house, brothers and sisters. How was the, uh, the kind of coming up from that perspective? Uh, yeah, I had a, um, mother and a father clearly to some degree, you know, we all have to at sure. least you know, somehow until we figure out a way to not. Um, and, uh, uh, a brother and a sister, but uh, we were not a musical family and um, still aren't, you know. Um, I'm the only one who did this sort of thing. And uh, there wasn't a lot of, uh, uh, this is great. We're super happy that you're doing this. I didn't start until uh, playing guitar until I was in my late teens. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I, was, I would say there's you know, virtually zero um, uh, uh, um Influence from home. <laughs> That's the best way to put it. Sure. No, no, uh, uh, um, no, uh, uh, no one there uh, pushing me along to make this to 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 to, to try to uh, uh, follow my dreams, whatever they may be. At that time, I didn't really have a lot of dreams as far as like music was concerned, but I knew I liked doing it, and I didn't have a plan B, and I had no interest in going to college, and I viewed people that went to college as suckers. I still do. Right, because they're they're just you know a ma- massive amounts of debt after the time that they have got a piece of paper that says they're a legitimate human being. Well, that's certainly one issue of it that, that I would have a problem with. Um, I just am not a joiner in her. You know, I'm going to go to college like everybody else. You know, <laughs> I just don't have any. I just think it's stupid. I mean, if you have people telling you that's the right thing to do, there has to be something wrong with it. All those people can't be right. Right. As a matter of fact, they're mostly wrong. Sure. So, well, it's it's institutions. It's uh, it's pushing against the conventions, and that uh, people don't like to do that. I guess so. But even then, once you once you get, um, once you, well, I'm not in it now. I'm in the you know underground, whatever it is. I still push against that too because I, I'm not comfortable, you know, being belonging to any kind of group. <laughs> right. Totally. 
<laughs> well, now, I, I definitely. If you're part of the grunge movement, I'm not. I was never comfortable with any of that. I was never part of any of that. Right. I never operated the way those people do. I never did anything like that. And we were doing it before they were. And uh, you know, you show me a club, I'll t- I'll show you uh, uh, the line to not join it. You know. <laughs> Sure, sure. What is it? The, the, the uh, Groucho Marx saying of uh, any club yeah. that wants me? Yeah, exactly. Groucho Marxist. Exactly. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. I'm cl- very much that. I, I'm, I'm not, I think by the time everybody's doing it, it's way too late. Totally. <laughs> you've, you, you've zigged where everyone else has zagged. Well, it's not even like it's, it's not like being perverse. It's just, I, I, that's what makes me happy. You know? Yeah, you live in your space, and that's perfect. Have you? I, I don't want to be part of. You know, it's not, it's not like I want to go out and, and not be a part of it. I want. I would love to have millions of people buy my records. Mm-hmm. You know, I work beaver away doing what I'm doing, and I'm very proud of what I'm doing. People have this idea that we don't care, we don't give a fuck about any of that stuff. That's all bullshit. I operate the way I would wish other bands would operate. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not. I don't do it out of a place of not caring. What I don't care about is whether someone else accepts it or not. Right. It's not that I don't care about it. I care very greatly about it. It's my whole life, you know? Well, yeah, and it, it, I think it goes to show, and I mean, you've spoken about this before, where the, the idea that, uh, you know, because you may not care about the public acceptance of, you know, your musical output is the fact that you might not work that hard on it, but, you know, that's not true at all. Like you, sl- I mean, from my, my perspective, is you slave over it. Yes, I worry over it a great deal. No one thinks about this more than I do, you know? And uh, so then when I have somebody would even suggest that I don't care about what I'm doing, it's just, that's just, it's it's highly insulting. Right. Totally. Yeah. Like it's like this lackadaisical attitude that is approached to music and it's like, well, no, like that's not the case at all. (laughs) Yeah. We don't care what you think. So therefore you shouldn't care about (laughs) us either. You know, I don't think that at all. Yeah, definitely. At least. Not at all. That's how they take it, because whether they know it or not, we're a threat to them. You know? Sure, no, it's a very good point. Because we don't conform to whatever it is they want us to do. Mm-hmm. Whether they, you know, the free, freest thinking people I've ever met, or so they thought, were some of the most narrow-minded assholes I've ever been around. Sure, <laughs> just because. Almost every way. Sure. You know? Don't be late to the anarchy meeting. You know. So, right. <laughs> Because it becomes dogma, you know, it's it's wrapped around them so tightly that uh, they can't see the forest from the trees, too. Yeah, yeah, and then there's a there's a quote me and Dale always like from Easy Rider, the movie Easy Rider, where it says, you know, Jack Nicholson says, uh, if uh, uh, people if you tell people they're not free, they'll start killing and maiming to prove that they are. But if if they actually see someone that's free, it'll really scare them. <laughs> Totally. They're like, whoa, that doesn't look like anything that I'm doing. <laughs> you know, I'm totally free. It's like, well, you know, most of these people have never ventured outside of the confines of whatever everyone else around them is doing, especially hipsters. Sure. They're the worst ones of all. I might, they might as well be fucking fundamental Christians. Right. <laughs> totally. It's the, yeah. the sa- it's the same notion. They're just, uh, you know, maybe it's the not. Same, same people. Yeah. <laughs> The same people that that uh, uh, were involved in the uh, um, Spanish Inquisition are these people, the young, free-thinking individuals, right? The exact same who are rule crazy, you know, to the point of literally burning people alive. <laughs> sure, definitely. Um, and so, it, w- what does your parents do for a living? Like, and how you know were you kind of like you know just your sort of uh, average you know middle to lower class home? Like, how was that makeup? Yeah, definitely lower middle class. Um, above the poverty line for once I got into my teens, but mm-hmm. before that, certainly not. Um, uh, uh, if I wanted money, you know, I definitely ha- had to go out and earn it. Sure. And my parents, you know, had, they had their own problems, and they had, you know, they were doing the best they could under those circumstances. I didn't expect them to write checks, right? Stupid shit for me, you know. I mean, I just that never came up. What they what they do for work? My dad worked in the timber industry. My mom did a wide variety of things. Um, part part was a, just being a mom, which I think is a huge job, highly honorable job that's mm-hmm. not taken seriously for some reason. And um, uh, and then now does has done a wide variety of work since the kids are all gone. You know, sure. And where did you end up in the the kid spectrum? Like, are the youngest, middle, or oldest? Oldest. Oldest. So and my parents were very young when they had me, so you were the trailblazer. Yeah, good for me. <laughs> um, 
And so uh, you, you've mentioned in previous interviews in regards to kind of, you know, your introduction to music being, you know, the more arena rock stuff, you know, whether it was like Kiss, that sort of stuff. Um, but then you were immediately gravitated towards the, um, you know, the kind of attitude and aggression of punk rock and everything like that. How how did that get kind of hand delivered to you um, in regards to like, you know, was it a classmate that showed you that stuff? How did the uh, the, the punk kind of infiltrate your life? No, there was no classmates. Um, <laughs> I there were no one, no older brothers who were hit that were showing me stuff. There was none of that. None of that was happening. Um, uh, I guess it would stem from like you know seeing uh, pictures of some of these bands in magazines starting with Bowie. You know, we're talking when I was twelve, so it was like you know seventy six. Mm-hmm. Listening to Bowie albums and then buying records like. Um, you know, Lodger and uh, uh, Heroes when they came out, you know. Um, not because, uh, for, only only out of um, magazines, uh, subscription, or a magazine, uh, they'd have things like in Cream or one of those types of magazines where you could buy records because there's no record stores where I lived. Mm-hmm. Um, there was one about 15 miles from my house in Aberdeen that was called Bilbo Baggins. So you, you can imagine what sort of records they had. <laughs> oh, totally. Uh, and every time I went into the place, they acted like I was going to steal something. So I didn't feel super welcome. I never became friends with any of the people there. Plus, when you're 12 years old, 15 miles might as well be 1,500 miles, you know? Um, uh, I was not getting a lift from anyone to the record store. There was, uh, you know, we lived in the middle of nowhere. So my key to that was uh, in mail order and so I would buy a band you know like Bowie record simply because of the way it looked and um, and then it just kind of grew from that you know seeing pictures of people like the Sex Pistols and stuff like that in, in magazines and thinking it looked like it was something I was interested in I liked the way Bowie looked and uh, his uh, music really appealed to me well I'll tell you you know, you're in seventh grade in rural Washington State in the mid '70s, listening to Hunky Dory. You, you don't have a lot of people that are on your side. <laughs> sure, <You're, laughs> people are. Most people are probably like, "Yo, yo, what's what's he into?" This is. Really I didn't weird. even play. I didn't even play it for him. You know, there was, I didn't have anybody that I was, you know, getting into that kind of thing with. There's no one. Just me. You know. Yeah, sure. You're again the trailblazer. <laughs> Yeah, you know, for better or worse, it was a lonely world, lonely existence. I don't have any happy memories from any of those times. I don't like that area. I don't like rural anywhere, really. Um, uh, um, it put me right off of it, of that kind of that, that kind of thinking, that kind of living. I have no interest in it. You know, I'm a I'm urban. I'm a, I, I want to live in it. I want to be an urban adventurer. Sure. <laughs> they had half my life. Isn't that enough? You know. Yeah. Sure. Well, that's interesting that you immediately kind of wrapped your head around the idea that like, Hey, I, you know, I, cause I, I know most kids that live in a rural area that get exposed to any sort of culture realize that the culture is not there in their city. So they need to go elsewhere. But that's interesting that you were just like, Oh yeah, I gotta get, I gotta get out of here for many different reasons. Well, you know, you don't realize that until you get mobile, you know, as soon as you're able to leave, then you start leaving. I mean, unless you, I mean, I've known you know, like the first drummer in the Melvins is, lives one mile from the house. He was, went home from the hospital in, you know? Right. I mean, he was not destined to move from there. He goes, he's married to the woman that he went to was, went, went out with when he was in eighth grade, you know? Sure. They have kids. It's just not going to happen. It was not going to happen, but I just had no ties there and just felt nothing. Sure. Still, I don't have any good things to say about it. That it's my whole experience growing up there. Nothing. Yep. Nothing. Not one thing. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I'm still friends with the, the, the two guys that I was friends with then, but they're, you know, like him and, uh, another guy named Dan that I've been friends with since the seventies and both. And, and, uh, they, uh, I still talk to those guys weekly, but beyond that, I don't have anything there that I could call, uh, you know, Oh yeah. Going home. Good memories. None of that. No. Yeah. No. You just no, no, no. my life started after I left there. Sure, couldn't wait to get out. It was a bunch of people who didn't like me, you know, and uh, uh, I the, 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 it wasn't me, you know. Totally, <laughs> this, is not, this is not my bag. It's not for me. It's not the world. It's not my bag. I don't have any interest in it, and I have nothing good to say about it. Right, and so I, I'm presuming that because of that, the way you're describing it, you know, you didn't care about high school, and you were basically just biding your time until you could get out of there. 
Well, knowing what I know now, I would have just quit. You know, probably after about eighth eighth grade. You know, <laughs> okay. I wouldn't have went to high school. It's a complete waste of time. You know, and I think for the vast majority of people, unless you're interested in getting totally indoctrinated into you know cube speak, then uh, um, it's a, it's a horrible place. You know, I mean, uh, you know, I'm just not into it. Sure. I mean, it's a bad idea. Sure. I mean, they, t- they tell you, basically tell you now, the, the, the schools have you for 12 years, and at, at the end of those 12 government y- or go- years of government schooling, you're an unemployable moron. <laughs> Essentially, that's what they tell you. That's true. You know? So well, it's like, well, why don't you fix the first 12 years, as opposed to trying to get us to go to four more years, <laughs> you know? Yeah. No, it doesn't come up. That's uh, it's really. I mean, it's very interesting because you do see that where uh, you know y- you find that most people are obviously wanting to pursue their passions and what they're interested in, and oftentimes, you know, people that have been influenced by you know subculture and independent music or whatever, you know, they're touring when they're in high school, and like that notion is like, what? What do you mean you're touring in high school? And, like you're booking shows? That doesn't make any sense. And like you're building all these like real life world skills that people aren't developing until like you said, where they're dropped off in the middle of a world and be like, Hey, do you know how to do this? You're like, no, I barely just passed my science class or whatever. And so it's interesting to hear that train of thought. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much against that kind of uh, you know, herd mentality. You know, I'm, I'm not into it. It's, it's, it's not for me. I don't think I shouldn't be for anyone. You know? Yeah, sure. It's, uh, I love that. It's not for me. And you know what? It shouldn't be for anyone. <laughs> Yeah. Shouldn't be. Yeah, if that's what you want. There's nothing I can't, I can't help you. You know, I'm not happy with that. Yeah, totally. So, you know, I would never. I would no interest in pursuing something along those lines. And there's no plan B for me. Right. Yeah. You weren't. There wasn't. Uh, you know, a, uh, a English degree in the background that you were uh, you were pursuing as well. <laughs> well, okay. I, let's say I get an English degree. What am I going to do? Teach? Uh, that's pretty much it. Yeah, I'd rather eat a gun. Right. You know? <laughs> Honestly, sure. What am I, you think you think that teaching is going to, you know, what am I going to go in there and teach a bunch of kids? I would just turn into a monster. Sure. You, I would sit there and tell, I would want to tell parents, I don't care about your kid and I don't care about you. Right. I don't care if they get an education or learn anything because you people are idiots. Right. <laughs> you're, you're sending them to me and I'm getting paid for this. I don't care. Right. I don't care about your, I don't care about your kid's education. That's for you to care about. Sure. Not for me to care about. Right. You know, I'm not your babysitter. And if your little bitch kids can't keep in line, that's not my problem. <laughs> I'll just push them through and the next person in line can take care of it. That's how the education system works. For sure. That's how it works. Yep. You know, so what's the good part? <laughs> Other than having parents having a baby, a tax funded babysitter for six hours a day, you know? Sure. It's a total waste of time. And so, uh, you know, on, on the notion of you, like you were saying, you didn't pick up you know, the guitar until in your late teens. Um, like, did you have the notion, like once you started to, you know, play guitar and then obviously the, uh, you know, influence of, of, of punk and, you know, going to shows in that perspective, were you immediately taken with the idea of playing in a band or was that something you worked up to? Not immediately wanted to, but, you know, I mean, we've often joked that we had low, very low um, expectations, you know, just the idea of playing a show would be fun. That's it on a stage. I mean, the idea of making a record or touring or actually making any money doing it wasn't something that ever crossed our minds. You know, we just thought it'd be fun. But I also have no problem with anyone making money playing music. You know, there seems to be a, 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 a contingent of hipsters who think that, you know, being a profit oriented in any way is somehow wrong which I think is a mistake. Sure. I mean, I think that you should be fairly paid for whatever it is you're doing. Sure. You know, I'll, I'll, fairly being the, main, the, 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 the operative word. Yeah, yeah absolutely. No question. You know? Hey, on that tip is something I was going to hit a little bit later, but you know, the, uh, you know, clearly when you're doing all these things, you know, in relation to a band, like, you know, booking shows and, you know, putting out a seven inch and all of these, uh, these, you know, things that revolve around a band, uh, you know, clearly that's the business aspect of a band. Did, was that something that you felt comfortable handling as you started to, you know, play out with the Melvins and everything like that? Or is that something that you were just like, yo, I don't want to touch any of that. I, I don't care about that at all. Someone else will hopefully take care of it. Um, or how did it sit in your head? 
No, I had no problem taking care of it. I had no problem in, 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 in figuring it out and uh, th- trying to figure out how, how to make it work. No problem with that. Got it. Uh, I think I have a, a wide, vast knowledge of how the music industry works, and I'm far, far more of a realist about it than uh, almost anyone I know. <laughs> and how w- was that just basically through your experience that you really started to uh, you know learn from that perspective, or was it you know talking to all your friends that were involved, or was it just basically your purview? I got really no advice from people at all. I just did it from uh, viewing, watching how this worked. You know, I mean, we learned early on that it wasn't going to be fair. You that you were going to have to f- figure out a way to make it fair, and fair doesn't mean someone should give you something that you haven't done. That's not fair. That's not fair at all. Fair means, um, uh, uh, like, for instance, when we moved to San Francisco in, I don't know, 86, 87, around in there, um, around the time that the Maximum Rock and Roll place opened, you know, they were like, well, we expect the bands when they play here to help clean up and do all this work. I go, well, you know, we've done our part by being in a band and practicing all week at a place that we're paying for, you know, and you, you guys, people here who aren't in bands, it's your part to take care of the club, <laughs> do all this stuff, you know, right. it's like, I've already done my part, but what you really want to do is you want to take me down a few notches from my rock star throne and make me scrub a toilet or something like that. Like, no, I already do that. Sure. I'm doing my part by being in a band. Right. You know, that's what they kind of miss out on. Without the bands, they have nothing. Yeah. Oh, it's no, it's very true. Yeah. I mean, you know, not that they need to be treated, you know, like royalty or anything like that, but let's, you know, let's get things straight here. You're not using me as your little social experiment, you know, <laughs> to try to kill rock stars. If you don't like the rock stars like Van Halen, then don't go. Don't take it out on me. <laughs> I'm on your side. Totally. We're, we're, <laughs> you know? we're in the trenches together on this. Like, you don't need to be punishing me for this. Right. And so I realized really quickly that that was not something I wanted to be a part of. Sure. I had no interest in my, in my pursuing that kind of idealism on, the, uh, on that narrow-minded of a scale at all. Sure. You know, I mean, we want the most offensive thing about us to be how we sound. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Not our political views or any of that bullshit, you know? Yeah, that's just, that's that's noise. That's what that is. Well, you know, it, I have a lot of political views, but I don't use them in the band, you know? I, it's, 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 uh, um, it's not something that I think uh, 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 should be discussed because I really don't think that there's a, um, a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, freedom when it comes to that kind of thing. Sure. I, 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 I do find I'm that... A, yeah, I'm a, you know, class, classical uh, liberal, you know? Right. In, the, in, the, in the most hardcore sense of the word, sure. most people wouldn't even know what that meant. I'm a real liberal, right? Well, it's funny because I, I do find that, like you know, in do. I think two of the funniest things for me anytime I prepare to do an interview is you know when I whatever you know I'm diving in other interviews, but like when you type in the Google bar, there's two things that always make me laugh. Like you know if you type in Buzz Osborne, and then of course you know all the other auto population things come up. But anytime anybody has like uh you know like net uh, net worth or net income, I'm just like so people are googling the fact like hey how much is Buzz worth, and I'm just like what the fu-? that's so weird that people care about that. And then two the fact that you know people are really so interested in being like. I want to hear Buzz's like, you know, two hour takedown of like the government. And I'm just like, you've never, like you, you've always been the person where it's just been like, Oh yeah. Like, you know, that's not part of the band. So like, you know, I'll, I'll give bits and pieces, but I'm not going to talk at length about this because it's not relevant to this particular thing that I'm doing right now. Well, mostly they can't handle it. (laughs) I see. They can't handle it. And so I'm not going to go there. Sure. I'm not going to, there's no point in arguing with idiocy. None. Sure. So I just don't, I just don't go there. Yeah. If they want to think I'm a hardcore right wing or left wing person, they're out of their minds. Right. Yeah. They're, they're, they're reading between I'm lines part, that don't exist. I'm part of those clubs. I'm not part of those clubs, you know, but it's, the second you say anything, then you're accused of it. Absolutely. It's like, well, did you like Barack Obama? No. Well, did you, did you like, uh, uh um, Sarah Palin? No. You know, it's like, who did you vote for for president? I voted no for president. You know, you know, they, they can't deal with it. Sure. They can't deal with it. And I'm not an anarchist. I just, I'm not, I refuse to be, to belong to any of those, any of those kinds of things. Right. So there's no room for that. There's no room for that in my life. You know, it's true. I, I, I see through all of it and I'm not taken in by any of it. 
Sure. So, so if they want to view me as some moron, I'm not going to let them uh, hate me because of my political beliefs. I'm not going to allow that to happen. Right. You yeah. Know, that, so I'm not. Gonna, I'm not going to engage them because I know engaging them is not safe. Totally. It's for your own sanity too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I, mean, I, I, I have no problem arguing with that, but not in that. Not in that. Uh, uh, with on that platform. Right. Know? Good point. Good point. iHeartRadio and Grim and Mild present Bridgewater Season 2. A lot of people now actually believe that there is some kind of mystical force in this region that attracts monsters and paranormal activity. The Bridgewater Triangle. Now that sounds about right. You're still denying that there's something beyond our understanding going on here? Starring Supernatural's Misha Collins, The Walking Dead's Melissa Ponzio, and Rogue One's Alan Tudyk. Written by Lauren Shippen and created by me, Aaron Mankey. Something about all of this doesn't feel right. Hello? Is someone there? Something went wrong here. Olivia, we should hurry. We have a much bigger problem. What is that? Olivia, run! Listen to Bridgewater now on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. And learn more over at grimandmild.com slash Bridgewater. What's up? It's Angela Yee, and I want to tell you about my podcast, Lip Service. I created Lip Service as a safe space for women to talk about whatever they want to when it comes to the bedroom with no judgment. Lip Service means fun conversations and the freedom to talk about whatever you want. Lip Service is the one place where you can hear artists talk about the intimate details of their life and subjects that you might not hear anywhere else. It's where Nick Cannon felt safe enough to open up about some controversial topics with his love life. The stork is on the way. You know, there's a lot of kids last year. Oh, my God. Also, Lizzo sat down and discussed dating. This was before she was in a relationship. Oh, we never spoke after that, though. We didn't want to know why. Okay, listen. (laughs) And even Cardi B came on recently, where she had a great time talking about life before her marriage to Offset. I thought he wanted a bad and bougie. You got a bad and got a... (laughs) (laughs) Make sure you check out my podcast, Lip Service, on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Do you crave a good mystery? Tune in to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio podcast featuring episodes of different detective dramas from the golden age of radio every day Monday through Saturday. The lineup of radio detectives currently includes Sam Spade, Dr. Tim Detective, Dangerous Assignment, Philo Vance, Yours Truly Johnny Dollar, and Tales of the Texas Rangers. I'm your host, Adam Graham, and I offer commentary and humor after each episode and also respond to your questions and feedback. Enjoy a good mystery before bed, while driving, or whenever you crave old-school radio goodness. Listen to the great detectives of old-time radio on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcast, or wherever you get your podcast. Breaking the action to tell you about another amazing podcast on the Jabberjaw Network, and that is called Manage Metal. Hosted by two of my close friends, Mike Mowry and Rob Blasco, both previous guests on this very show. But basically, they deconstruct the music industry. They take a very specific topic, talk about it for 20 minutes. Their podcast is very, very valuable if you are interested at all in playing in bands or the music industry at large. They uh, they answer questions very honestly, earnestly, and are, are straight and to the point. It's not this like hour and a half long sort of pontificating about the music industry they really get to the nitty-gritty of it so please listen to that show you can listen to an apple podcast or wherever you listen to this very show you'll find the managed metal podcast there so here is my the rest of my discussion with buzz is the Melvins ostensibly like you're the first band that uh, you played in from a, a touring and releasing music perspective? I know you had you know a variety of projects that existed before that, um, but was Melvins kind of the you know the first band that you felt like you know was actually getting out there? Yeah, I mean it's really the only one I've ever really tried much at. You know, sure. I had some pretty good success with my uh, solo acoustic thing. I'll probably do more of that. You know, sure. But I haven't never really tried a new band. We had uh, the Crystal Fairy thing, but that, I don't think that's going to happen. So, sure, um, we'll see down the line. But I'm not going to hold my breath. Right, right, yeah. Um, 
and so you know kind of focusing on once you were you know you started to get out there and play shows and you know put out records and everything like that um did you immediately like uh touring and you know seeing the world from that perspective or was that something that you uh kind of had to learn to get used to well we did a tour in 86 and um it was a disaster, a financial disaster. And everywhere we went, we were met with a bunch of skinheads who wanted to kick our, our long haired asses, you know? Sure. And I said, I would never tour again. Never. Wow. <laughs> because it, I could see no, no worth in going out there and playing to no one or playing to an audience who wants to kill you. I saw absolutely zero worth in that. I don't need to drive to Florida to have that happen. You know, so what we did is we said we would never do it again, and we concentrated on playing locally, and playing maybe within not that far of a drive from where we were at home, and then we kind of did the the, the the West Coast a little bit, and but we I just thought it was stupid. I thought it was a bad idea that for bands to go out on tour and lose a bunch of money, you know, to and play to people who don't care. I think I think it's a, I still think it's a bad idea. I, I told that to people in California, bands in California. I go look, California is a big state. It's got lots of places that you can play. You could probably do at least ten shows just in the state of California. Now, if you set up a tour as an unknown band and you can't go on the road in California and make ends meet, if you can't make that work with San Francisco, San Diego, and Los Angeles all in your itinerary, then you certainly cannot make that work going all the way across the United States. Right? Don't do it. Sure. <laughs> Unless you're like hooked up with it. Like, oh, we're going to do an opening slot with this, some other band who's already got an audience. Well, that's a different scenario. We never had that come up. <laughs> you know? So, well, yeah. so uh, I think it's a severely bad idea for bands to do that until they can afford to do it. And I think it, it's one of the things that, that makes it to where bands are finished. Sure. You know? Yeah. But you, how many bands do you think have taken that advice? Oh, zero. zero. Of course. <laughs> they well, don't want to hear it. Because okay, go ahead and play to no one in Delaware. Good luck. Now now you can't get a show in New York. What a surprise. You know, I just I just think it's a terrible idea. So then we didn't, we put out the Ozma record in, uh, when we moved to San Francisco. And then after that came out, that was doing okay. And um, I think it was 88. And um, we got some offers from a uh, booking agent who's, convinced us that we could do a tour mm-hmm. and so around that time we did a tour and we actually it actually worked the the winds of time had changed you know right and uh we uh, didn't do tremendously well but we did good enough to where we made a little bit of money so that was when it really when that whole idea of thinking took off you know because i always joke how many tours you think i'm going to do or albums you think that i'm going to make that don't make me any money it will be less than two (laughs) right (laughs) yeah i can stay home and make nothing sure yeah you 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 could just sit there and be like yes this is i will still create music but uh yeah you're not going to see me out there on the road Um, yeah but even if i do even if i create music if i'm not going to put out a bunch of albums that lose me a ton of money there's no point i don't have the money to do that sure right no (laughs) it's true how how many you think oh this one lost you lost thousands and thousands of dollars on this do you want to do another one no i don't yeah thanks but no thanks I have no interest in that. And, and, and so solely on a financial thing. It doesn't mean I won't I'll quit playing music. I just, you know, if, if, if that kind of stuff happens, you have to quit doing it in a traditional form, whatever that may be, and rethink what you're doing. Sure. I've never been in a position that I could go out and lose a ton of money. Right. Now, if I want to lose a ton of money, I'll go on a big vacation, you know? <laughs> yeah, I'll do, do something that's, like, personally enriching. Yeah, I'm not driving to, you know... Tallahassee, Florida, and playing to no one. I'm not going to do it. <laughs> yeah, not interested. <laughs> nope. It doesn't make me feel better. It doesn't build character. You know, pain is not therapeutic. Sure. <laughs> Um, and so then, you know, like you said, as you started, because I, I was definitely just from my outsider's perspective um, and observing, you know, your, your guys' career, it definitely felt, you know, you know, late 80s were you, the rise started to happen, like you said, where you could actually go yeah. on tour and people paid attention to you. Um, yeah. Was that was that weird to get attention? Just because, like you said, you didn't expect anybody to really pay attention to what you were doing. Um, you know, how did that you know, notion, and I'm going to use this in air quotes because you can't see me, but like, quote unquote, success start to, you know, infiltrate you where it was like, oh, this is weird. I can't believe that, you know, 300 people are here. I don't, it doesn't make sense to me, but cool. Well, I never really believed it would work. So that's kind of how it worked. 
Okay. You know? Right. I knew, always knew I liked it. I always knew I believed in what I was doing. But as far as me having faith in the general public, understanding it and totally helping me out financially, I have no faith in that. None. And so we op- we've operated like it's not going to work for a long time. And when you operate under those kind of circumstances, it, it tends to work out better for you than going, well, you know, we're sure we're going to sell 2 million records in this next one, so we'll spend money like we were going to do that. And then it only sells 500000 which is a huge success, but it's a massive failure because you set yourself up for failure. I've never done that. Right. <laughs> I always figured it was going to fail and wasn't going to work, so we just have operated along those lines. Sure. It's a- I try to do something. I think this is what I need to do to make a bunch of money, and it doesn't work. Then you're worse off than than you were by, by doing nothing. Sure. <laughs> and and no. I'm and I'm sure because of you know your own personal you know opinions like in regards to the band as far as like you were saying you always plan for the worst case scenario because you know at that at that point you won't be disappointed um i'm sure the people that were uh, you know attempting to blow smoke up your ass from a business perspective um were just completely off put by you or did they like you because you you know spoke so plainly no no they want to hear this they want to hear the same story over and over and over you sure. know okay they want to be told they're amazing while they tell you you're amazing you know Sure. And I, I never lied to anybody, but I also didn't, you know, it's like, you know, we're on a line. Do you want to go to this glad handing radio party? No, I don't want to go. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do that. No, you guys don't want to play us on the radio? Fine with me. I, I can't do it. I just can't do it. I can't pursue it that way, the way everybody else does. I just can't do it. Do you want to go to a Grammy party? No, I don't. I don't like the Grammys. I don't care about that kind of thing. It doesn't make any difference to me. I don't even care about that aspect of the business. I never have. That's why I was interested in punk rock to begin with. Right. Exactly. You know, doesn't it doesn't interest me? I I don't. You know, hate those people or anything like that. It's just not for me. Sure. And I don't have any interest in pursuing. You know, if that's what it takes for me to do it, I'll figure out something else. Right. And it, it it sounds to me that you've always operated off uh, that instinct um, rather than like going and experiencing said thing and then realizing it sucks and then never doing it again. Had you ever gone down any of those roads in regards to like you said, I mean, you know, using those random anecdotal examples that you brought up of like, oh, yeah, OK, whatever. I'll go to this thing. I'll do this radio show. I'll do these things. And then once you're there, then you realize it sucks and then you obviously bail out or n- never do it again. Had you gone down any of those roads, or has it always been pretty pretty steadfast? No. Well, we did some big tours around Atlantic with bands that I wouldn't have toured with now. Um, we learned our lesson pretty quickly about all that kind of stuff, but that's really not how we want to sell the band, you know? Um, not that I... Uh, um, I'm against uh, playing, opening up for a band in those kinds of places. I mostly couldn't stand dealing with the bands themselves and their road crew, you know? That was the worst part of it. I can the audience I can handle. Mm-hmm. It's the behind the scenes stuff that is insufferable to me, you know. So I just couldn't put myself in that position. I quit wanting to put myself in that position unless it was going to be for so much money, or the people were extremely nice, then it made then it made financial sense, or I knew I wasn't going to get fucked with. Right. <laughs> but beyond that, you know, if you ask me, such and such bands want you to tour with them. The, my big concern is being treated like garbage. Right. You know my main concern because uh, you know you can you can think you know what i am but you have no idea (laughs) sure you You can't treat me like crap i'm not going to put up with it it's going to cost you a lot of money to be able to do that (laughs) right well it's it's a very good point you you know you you hear more certain more horror stories of people going out on you know these huge arena tours and being like oh yeah so like the headlining band like we saw them you know once and then we were put in like you know a broom closet for the rest of the tour or whatever you definitely don't hear more stories about people being like oh yeah the headlining band was great they let us have this huge room and like you know all these other positive things like that's definitely more of the minority well we certainly had that kind of thing happen and it came from very surprising places you know I mean like a band's like we opened for Kiss when they first put their music and makeup back on uh-huh. they could not have been nicer you know yeah it's amazing they were missed, totally cool and to this day, and, and we're, we're, we've never sold millions of records. You know, we're nothing. If I ever run into those guys anywhere, they're totally cool. Right. You know, like really nice. Right. Real human beings. 
I just ran into Paul Stanley at, of all places, Disneyland. <laughs> what does he say? Hey, how's it going? Good to see you. You know, he's they're really, really cool. Right. So people can say what they will about those guys, but my personal experience, I only had a good one. You know, they they treated us as good or better than any ba- headline band we ever played with. Who would have thought? Right. That's amazing. You know, it's the exact opposite of what you think, which is usually the case. Right. No, it's true. Yeah, like the 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 people who may have a you know good public facing appearance are the ones that end up you know like you said treating people horribly in the background. Yeah. And then the flip side, you know, is like, wait, what? This band shouldn't be nice, but they totally are. Well, it's, it's sort of like in the punk rock world, the guys with ethics—they're the first ones to screw you over. Right. <laughs> true. The fastest because they think if you're worried about money, you're not cool. Therefore, we can just do whatever we want. Because we have we have that moral high ground, totally. And I, you know, you know, I'll take I'll take Gene Simmons over that any day. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, I don't need some punk ass bitch looking looking down his nose at me because he thinks he's better than I am. You know, right. I'll go ahead head with you anytime you want. <laughs> right. <laughs> You're like, no problem, man. No uh, problem. You know, mostly I just avoid that kind of stuff. It doesn't come up much. You yeah. Know? Right. Well, I mean, it, 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 it's good, too, because since you've existed, you know, uh, a while in the music world, people know what they're getting when they're, you know, coming up against the Melvins, whether it's like not only... Uh, you know, f- from like a, a live show perspective, like, and not even so much from like, oh, I'm going to get a standard Melvin's experience because you know, you you know just as much as anybody that you know your standard live show doesn't exist within the Melvin's context. But people know, like, if they're asking you guys on tour, they need to uh, you know come correct, so to speak. It doesn't come up much. I mean, we get offered some offers, but usually the money is so bad, I just say no. Right. You know? It doesn't even get to that point. <laughs> I don't even want to, you know, I don't even want to discuss it. You know, it's like, thank you. It's very nice of you, but you know, I just, I won't do it. <laughs> totally. We can do our own shows. We can go to San Diego and make more than that. So um, I don't see any reason why, unless it's some special thing where, you know, it's gonna, we think it's going to be really cool, but it's the kind of thing that doesn't happen very often. Yeah, sure. I don't pursue it, you know? Right, right. And I'm not against it, but it just has to be the right, th- right thing. Sure. You know? I don't want to get in any more fights with road crews. I don't want. I've done that enough. I don't want to do that anymore. You know, <laughs> totally. I want to put myself in that position. And so, you know, as you were, you know, as you were doing this, and you know, making the Melvins what what you guys eventually would be, um, you know, how did your, uh, you know, how did your parents and family, like, you know, like you said, there was never any support from the, you know, pursue your dreams perspective. Um, but as you started to make some, you know, niche of notoriety, did they start to be less concerned about you or were they always like, oh yeah, Buzz is going to come home and he's destitute and he'll be, you know, strung out on drugs and all these other horrible things. Or were they generally like, okay, like this, this seems to be going okay for him. So he can't be too concerned. Um, I think I remained a mystery in a lot of areas to them. Okay. You know, not a problem, but um, just a mystery. You know? um, they don't get it. I'm not one to try to educate them or anyone, really. You know, The less they know, the better. Sure. Right. It's just like in this interview. I'm not giving you any personal details. You know, <laughs> I don't know if you noticed. You know what I mean? Oh, oh, no, no, no. I know. I mean, and I'm not prying, but just the because. Uh, no, no, not the. I just mean I just I have a point of doing that. I'm really good at answering the question. I wish someone would have asked me. You know. <laughs> right. Right. And so, <laughs> like, do your your parents don't you know? When was the last time they like they saw you live? Oh, years. I told them not to come. It's not a good idea, you know? Sure. <laughs> I don't have to think about it. I don't want to have to worry about them. Right. right. You, you don't want to burst their eardrums or anything like that. Oh, I don't care about that. It's just I don't want them getting screwed with by some drunken idiot. You know? Sure, sure. This, the things you cannot control. No, no. We're not playing at the Staples Center, you know? <laughs> it's true. Um, or, yeah, the idea of my parents wandering through puke up to some horrible dressing room. I, yeah, I can't wait, you know? Yeah. Hey, hey Ma, I made it. <laughs> Yeah, you know I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not going to push that too much. It's better if they don't, you know. Sure, absolutely. Honestly, um, 
and you know kind of the uh, like we were talking about in regards to you know the reputation preceding the Melvins in regards to you know their bands are asking you on tour uh, you know they know what they're bargaining with in the same function that the people that are fans of what you guys do know that you know from record to record you're going to be getting a wildly different experience either you know from an experimental standpoint um, or something that is you know left of center than what they might be used to but generally speaking people follow you along um, or you know if they don't they obviously drop off and then they hop back on a record or two later um, maybe or- I figure new, new people come along okay I see you know people drop off I mean people you, know, you get to be about in your 30s, 30, 35, and people move on in their lives. I've seen it happen over and over. You know, they quit going to as many shows, they have kids, or they do something else. You know, so our audience stays about the same age. iHeartRadio and Grim and Mild present Bridgewater Season 2. A lot of people now actually believe that there is some kind of mystical force in this region that attracts monsters and paranormal activity. The Bridgewater Triangle. Now that sounds about right. You're still denying that there's something beyond our understanding going on here? Starring Supernatural's Misha Collins, The Walking Dead's Melissa Ponzio, and Rogue One's Alan Tudyk. Written by Lauren Shippen and created by me, Aaron Mankey. Something about all of this doesn't feel right. Hello? Is someone there? Something went wrong here. Olivia, we should hurry. We have a much bigger problem. What is that? Olivia, run! Listen to Bridgewater now on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. And learn more over at grimandmild.com slash Bridgewater. What's up? It's Angela Yee, and I want to tell you about my podcast, Lip Service. I created Lip Service as a safe space for women to talk about whatever they want to when it comes to the bedroom with no judgment. Lip Service means fun conversations and the freedom to talk about whatever you want. Lip Service is the one place where you can hear artists talk about the intimate details of their life and subjects that you might not hear anywhere else. It's where Nick Cannon felt safe enough to open up about some controversial topics with his love life. The stork is on the way. You know, there's a lot of kids last year. Oh my God. Also, Lizzo sat down and discussed dating. This was before she was in a relationship. Oh, we never spoke after that, though. We even want to know why. Okay, listen. (laughs) (laughs) And even Cardi B came on recently, where she had a great time talking about life before her marriage to Offset. I thought he wanted a bad and bougie. You got a bad and got a... (laughs) (laughs) Make sure you check out my podcast, Lip Service, on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Do you crave a good mystery? Tune in to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio podcast featuring episodes of different detective dramas from the golden age of radio every day, Monday through Saturday. The lineup of radio detectives currently includes Sam Spade, Dr. Tim Detective, Dangerous Assignment, Philo Vance, Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, and Tales of the Texas Rangers. I'm your host, Adam Graham, and I offer commentary and humor after each episode and also respond to your questions and feedback. Enjoy a good mystery before bed, while driving, or whenever you crave old-school radio goodness. Listen to the great detectives of old-time radio on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcast, or wherever you get your podcast. Sure. You, yeah, you guys have leveled off at that, uh, you know, whatever, 35 to 45-year-old person. No, it's much younger. But, oh, okay, nice. You know, we have young kids. We don't have. We're not not an oldies band at all. You know. Sure. No, that's. I mean, we have. It's mostly younger people. You know, that's mostly. There's some older people, but not like people in their forties. They're like hen's teeth at our shows. You know. Right. Right. Might be a few, but there's less and less every year. But there's you know people get older and you know. If it wasn't for young people, we'd have nobody at our shows. Sure. No, that's that. That's interesting. What do you attribute that to? When you're young, you want to go out and do these sorts of things. When you get older, you've kind of had it. After you've went to 300 shows, you're done. You know. Sure, that's a good point. And very often, they have other things going on in their lives. Sure, it makes sense. Yeah, you know? yeah, it does. Yeah, just from, you know, a, a sheer uh, kids have time, whereas adults don't because they have other responsibilities. Yeah, I mean, you're young. You want to be away away from home for a while. Maybe you're on drugs or taking or getting hammered. And the idea of being out of your parents' 
view for a lo- long amount of time is kind of nice. Sure. You know, that, that, that's something that you uh, want to do. I can understand that. Sure. Um, well, we're vastly older than our audience, usually. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, very, very few occasions. Yeah. Well, that's cool because, I mean, like you said, the, uh, you know, that, that sort of, uh, attendance at your shows, you know, is heartening the fact that, you know, like you said, you're not just, you know, like you said, some oldies band where you're just retreading the greatest hits and doing, you know, anniversary tours on records and stuff like that. Well, yeah, we probably don't need to make new albums, but you know, it's part of the deal as far as I'm concerned. Sure. That's part of the deal I made, you know? Sure. Yeah. And this you're... is what I do and until I can't do it anymore. I'm going to do it. Sure. You're living up to your end of the bargain. <laughs> yeah. I'm holding up my end of the bargain much more so than most. Right. <laughs> Um, and since, uh, you know, since making music has sensibly been your job, you know, ever since you, you know, started to, you know, the late eighties started to, you know, make a semblance of a living, um, you know, do you, do you feel like you have to be, you know, crave in other ways in order to keep you creatively focused on music? Like, you know, you have to have, uh, other interests in order to, um, you know, give you that space away from music. Uh, do you feel like you have that or can you still be so singularly focused on music, um, as being your, your, your central creative thrust? Well, it mostly is. Um, but you know, I mean, not unlike anyone who pursues a living, you know, there's very few of us who are born rich, you know, um, uh, and very few of us who inherit money that they won't have to work at least some amount for, you know, um, that's a very, very small minority of people. Uh, the rest of us will have to con- pursue, uh, a living. And so I don't feel like you know, if you take someone who works like, let's say a CEO of a corporation, they work a hell of a lot more than 40 hours a week, you know? Uh, um, and I feel like I don't work any harder or any less than they do at this, which isn't, isn't, uh, um, which isn't a surprise. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, if I had a bunch of fuck you money in the bank, then I might, uh, might not work as hard, but I, uh, my, then again, I might, I don't know. You know, I mean, uh, um, so I just feel like, you know, in order for me to keep doing what I'm doing, I have to put the time in. There's just no chance around that. You know, so I, I don't feel like I work extraordinarily more or less than someone who is as passionate at their work as I am, you know? Sure, sure. But it just shows you how lazy musicians really are. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. By and large. Sure, sure. I mean, this year we're going to, we got, we have the Crystal Fairy record come out in February. We'll have a new album in January. I mean, in uh, July, uh, June, July. And then we have another one that's done. It will probably come out sometime near the end of the year. That's three in one year. Last year we did two. You know, I mean, it's not, um, I don't feel like I'm a workaholic or doing, going crazy with it, but, you know, there's nothing wrong with making a record. Sure. Right. It's you, not hard to do. You know, you just have to work at it. Sure. Just got to focus on it. Yes. I think that that gets lost with a lot of people too, you know, sure. on what we're doing. It's like, no, actually we do records a lot. We do all kinds of projects that go along with the records that take a lot of time. I work very closely with my wife, who's a graphic designer. Uh, we work extremely hard on all of that sort of thing. She does a lot of printing with what we're doing. Um, we do a lot of crazy packages along those lines. Right. A lot of stuff that doesn't ever go to a store. Most of, most of which, um, we uh, also work very closely with um, oh, with uh, uh, um, Tom Hazemeyer doing all kinds of crazy things, as well as the uh, um, uh, stuff we do with Ipecac. Mm-hmm. And so that, that I'm surrounded by people who are really creative, and um, we do all kinds. Of, I do I do things like I've been working on a book. I've, we've done books ourselves. We've done a lot of things that were book like that are going on to uh, um, into special packaging that we're making. Uh, I love to, I love photography. Um, I've taken tons. You know, uh, something people might not understand or get or see because I haven't you know I haven't done a lot with it. Um, uh, I um, also I'm a big enth- enthusiast when it comes to sports. Like I love baseball, I love to play golf, I love and, and tennis, and all, all those sorts of things. So I don't have a lot of downtime at my house. Yeah. You know? Well, I mean, plus too, I'm constantly doing something. Plus, I write music, and 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 we have recorded, you know, well over four hundred songs. You know, um, 
There's not enough hours in the day. Sure. Well, I, I mean, I, you, you mentioned you mentioning all these things. Uh, that that sort of uh, you know creative uh, diversity that you're able to you know exercise keeps you you know prolific from a music creation standpoint. You know, because you know some people. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I mean, because otherwise it's like you, you know people end up going crazy if they are only solely focused on one thing for you know a year and that they don't experience life outside of that. Well, yeah. I mean, I don't know. I mean, you know, I mean, if you're going to be an expert at something, then you, some of your rest of your other parts of your life may suffer as a result of it. You know, like, you know, like, uh, I think I heard an analogy was that, you know, Wayne Gretzky spent, it was an amazing hockey player, but he probably forgot about a whole lot of other areas of his life. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. He was playing hockey a hundred thousand hours or something, you know? So, um, you know, I'm sure I, I, I lose other aspects of what my life is, but that's okay. You know, I mean, I don't mind that. I'm willing to work three times as hard myself in order to pursue what I'm doing. Right. Right. Than I would for working for somebody else, you know? Sure. Um, you actually brought up golf and that was the last thing I was going to ask you about was the, um, you know, because most people I think view, cause I mean, I myself am a, a golf enthusiast. Like I was, you know, junior PGA, you know, had a was cl- close to being a scratch golfer, but then, you know, You're a real golfer. I, well, I was at one point, but then music swallowed me up and, you know, I toured in hardcore and punk bands and, you know, the his- the history is written after that point. But, uh, you know, I, I always find, you know, a, a weird kinship in people that, uh, you know, like golf that are, you know, raised in this subculture because I, I feel most people look at it and are just like, the fuck is there to like about golf? Like, that's such a, you know, a, a, a white rich guy sport or whatever. You know, there's you know, obvious notions that you could kind of, you know, uh, pile cliches on top of. But when did you kind of get into it and what, what do you identify with it? Yeah, it's a white rich guy. That's why Tiger Woods has done so well at it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and all, and all, and the host of Asians that have played. And, exactly. You know. The South Korean that just uh, won the tournament uh, this past weekend. But yes. Yeah, yeah. It's all rich white guys, as usual, you know. <laughs> Um, I started about less than 10 years ago and uh, just because some friends of mine were playing, but, uh, uh, I got into it right away, you know, and I, I can't stand country club golf myself. I play municipal golf and I belong to a men's club for like the last three or four years, Nice. all their tournaments when I'm home and, um, you know, pursue it along those lines. So it's actual real golf, as you know, it's not, you know, not, not a normal golf. It's like tournament golf. Tournament, tournament golf. That's what I like, you know? Yeah, no, that's really cool. Like I said, I just, I, I, I always find um, it interesting because it, it it's not a common sport for people to get into. Um, that. It's hard. Yeah, it's really hard. <laughs> it's incredibly difficult. That's what, and that's why I think it turns people off of it because they're not good at it right away. You know, something like soccer. I mean, yeah, you know, you can figure that out in one afternoon. Oh, this is what you're supposed to do with golf. Good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> you know you can build a pot in one afternoon you know totally just say wait 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 15 to 20 years and then maybe you'll uh, be able to hit the ball reasonably far yeah i mean i've had my handicap down as low as nine you oh, know that's great that's, that's as low as i could get it but uh but right now it's you know hovering around 13 because i go on tour and stuff like that and i don't play at all right and uh you know so then i just concentrate on not on like music i you know golf as you know is all about scoring yep it doesn't matter what you do. You know, it doesn't matter how you do it. It doesn't matter how you hit the ball. None of that makes any difference if you can't put the ball in in less hole and less shots. Right. Totally. It doesn't matter what it looks like. You can have the most beautiful swing. I play with guys all the time who can outdrive me by a hundred yards and our scores are not more than two or three strokes different. And, and that frustrates them to no end. I'm sure. I'm sure it could, but if you just operate like the Terminator, down the middle, down the middle, down the middle, put it in, down the middle, down the middle, you know, right. you're going to have a lot better. If you're, if you're just talking about scoring and that's it, then you're going to have a lot better time. And if you just concentrate on the things that are important, which would be, oh, in golf, the most important would be chipping and putting. <laughs> yeah, the, sh- the short game, the unglamorous <laughs> the things that part. Everyone just think is the most boring thing about it. You go ahead with that long drive, you know, yeah. I'll see you at the game. Totally. We get we're you may get there quicker, but I'll, I'll get I'll get there and I'll we'll, like you said, you'll be scoring the same. <laughs> I'll be scoring near, nearly the same with no lessons, no nothing. Right. It's a completely screwed up game. But you might beat me, but it's not gonna, you're not going to beat me by, you know, more than about four or five strokes max. 
Yeah, that's incredible. <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, I'll, I'll be happy with my 83. <laughs> totally. You're like, hey, yeah. I, can po- I, can, I can post that score and I'm fine with that. Oh, yeah. yeah. I post them all, you know, and, and just let that go. But I, you know, do, I, do I have any ideas about, uh, uh, you know, doing anything beyond that? No. Right. Tournament golf is really worth what I really like or skins games or stuff like that. That's really fun. That, that I think has helped me more than taking lessons by far. Yeah, totally. But you're in a competitive mode. And I always felt like I had an edge uh, with no lessons or anything because I was used to looking stupid in front of people. Very, you know? Wow, that's interesting. I, I wouldn't uh, have made that connection for it's like, yeah, you know, you can completely, you know, get up in on a stage and, you know, make a fool of yourself. And yes, that's interesting. The correlation between so- the two. I realized, oh, and these guys, or you watch guys, you know, melt down, missing a you know two foot putt, which you're going to do. Right. I'm sure you've done. I'm sure you've missed the easiest putt you could possibly make. Absolutely. It looked out or whatever. You didn't hit. It. And then you watch guys are they're done for the day. <laughs> second, second hole. <laughs> they can't get over it. Totally. And, and, and you just go, well, you know, you've come to the conclusion that you're going to screw something up. There's no way around it. And it doesn't bother me. I don't care. Right. I don't care what they think. I'm going to look stupid at some point. So what? Totally. Move on. There's 18 holes. Right. A lot of golf. You're like, you're like I've, made, I've made myself look like a fool in front of a thousand people before. This is not a thousands. big deal. Yeah. Thousands of people. You think, this, you think missing a two foot putt's going to bother me? <laughs> I mean, I'm granite, you know. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I learned. I, I learned watching the, the Valley of Death ten thousand times worse than this. <laughs> it's no a, big deal to me. I know, plus, with golf, you know you're going to screw up, right? It's, you know it. It's not a know? game. Not a game of perfect. No, no. I'm not trying to be a pro. Just like I'm not trying to be Segovia, you know. Right. With the guitar, I'm not trying to be that. <laughs> you know, totally. I don't measure myself against pro golfers. Are you kidding me? You know, right? I want to do it. I want to derive the pleasure I want out of these specific things, and that's all. Yes, I'm gonna do as best I can with the tools that are in front of me, just like music. Right, that's funny. and golf is not a team sport, and I really like that. Right, and you know, you're quiet, and you you really only see people at the greens and at the tee box, and the rest of the time, you know, you're in a zen like state, or you're gonna play like crap. It's very true. It's very true. You walk off the course much more relaxed than when you walked on. Even if you walk, and I always walk the course. It's like you know, five or six mile walk, and you're in a much more centered place than you were when you started. It's exactly what I need. Yeah, you know, it's not a team sport. You know? <laughs> no, that's right. You have to finish. It doesn't matter if you're winning by two if you blow the last hole and shoot a ten. You know. Yep. Yep. <laughs> so I like that aspect of it too. Be disciplined and, and follow, you know, and that's why I, li- I like, you know, playing in, you know, playing tournament golf, doing that kind of thing. I think it's great. It's really, 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 really fun. That's awesome. That's awesome. But it's not like, you know, country club. To, I hate all that crap. I just hate it. I can't do it. I can't make that work. Believe it or not, country clubs aren't a big, aren't big fans of me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I could easily see that. <laughs> Hard as it might be to believe, whereas at a municipal course, you don't have to worry about that. People are like, municipal courses are crappy. That might be the case. But, you know, you go ahead and you do what you're going to do. I'm going to do what I'm going to do. And I, I'll be fine with that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> totally. Well, well, Buzz, thank you so much for doing this. Honestly, really appreciate it. And I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad we went to the places we did. So thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. All right. That is what we have with Mr. Buzz Osborne from the Melvins. And uh, thank you to Monica, his publicist, for hooking this up. And uh, she, I just really like people who are good at their job. You know, it's very nice to be able to deal with people who are like, hey, I'm going to schedule this interview at this time. And then I'm like, perfect, that'll work in my schedule. And then it happens. And I don't need to remind anybody. Like, everyone's just a true professional and adult across the board. I just love that. <laughs> it's funny. The older you get, the more... Um, you appreciate, I guess, efficiency and people that know their stuff. Trust me. So if you're 18 years old and you're like, oh, that's not that important to me, it will be. I promise. <laughs> I know that's like total old man talk right now. But anyways, thank you to that. And then thank you to Lowercase Noises for providing the music, as he always does for this particular show. He's on tour during the summer. Go check him out. And uh, the guest next week is this episode is going to be a, a chock full episode because I had a I have a little mini interview that I'm going to do with this awesome band called Conveyor and then I'm also the 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 meat of the bone so to speak or vegan meat for me is Matt Kareckis 
which of course logic would dictate that I would actually Google this before I'm saying it out loud. But Matt from Citizen, he is the vocalist and I, I adored this conversation and I can't wait to share it with you. So it's going to be quite a doozy next week and quite a long one. So for those of you that, you know, email me and are like, Hey, this, this episode wasn't even an hour. I'm like, I'm I'm sorry. Sometimes my conversations get there. Other times they don't, but this one will be chock full of goodies. So, um, yeah, that's what we got. And you can always email the show 100 words podcast at gmail.com. And then until next week, please take care of yourselves and be safe, everybody. You've been listening to the Jabberjaw Podcast Network, jabberjawmedia.com. When the world gets in the way of your music, try the new Bose Quiet Comfort Earbuds too. Next Gen Earbuds uniquely tuned to the shape of your ears. They use exclusive Bose technology that personalizes the audio performance to fit you delivering the world's best noise cancellation and powerfully immersive sound, so you can hear and feel every detail of the music you love. Bose QuietComfort Earbuds 2. Sound shaped to you. To learn more, visit Bose.com.